Hi, everyone, and welcome to our LLM Project Showcase, a chance for our amazing students to show off some of their great work. My name is Greg Lochnane, and I had the privilege to serve as the lead instructor for Fourth Brain's first ever Building with LLM's cohort just last month. I'll be your host today as we take a closer look at a few of the great projects that came out of that course from two students, Laura and Catch, who we'll meet today. During today's event, you'll learn exactly what they had to do to build and deploy these LLM projects using state-of-the-art tools and methods in just three weeks and what the journey felt like each step of the way. They'll also be sure to not just tell you about the projects, but to show you some of the actual code that they used to get the job done. A note on process today. We're going to make it interactive. Each speaker will have 15 minutes to present and demo their project, which will be followed by a brief Q&A period focused on project-specific questions. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a group Q&A where we can dive a little deeper into their own personal journeys into LLMs and generative AI. If at any point a question comes to mind that you'd like to ask, please put it directly in the YouTube live chat and our team will do our best to be sure that we get you an answer. Without further ado, let's get started with our LLM showcase. First off, what I wanna do is I wanna show each of you what the road to these LLM projects looked like from a curriculum perspective and from a project assignment perspective. Then we'll get right into project one and project two. So first off, this is kind of the overview of what everyone went through to make these projects happen. In week one, we were really focused on fine tuning and deploying LLM applications. And this is where the LLM project ideas for building that app, that next product really came together. In week two, we were, we were kind of focused in the course on this idea of building chat GPT for your data. So this would be a natural language interface to be able to ask questions directly to a document. In the course, we were really kind of focused on building and deploying a minimum viable LLM product in week two. This was sort of the heavy lift week. And we also were along the way building our own Langchain and OpenAI application. So there's an option in the course to go ahead and include those pieces of technology in the project and we'll see what the speakers chose to do today with their projects. And then the final week was really focused on how we could take this MVP and turn it into, through iteration, something a little more powerful, a little bit more refined, and a little bit more useful, taking some data-centric approaches. Uh, in week three, in the course, we also focused on talking about evaluation, metrics, how to tell if the output of your LLM is any good at all. So that's kind of what the speakers went through. They're going to go through a little bit more detail in their own presentations. And first up, we're going to hear from Laura Gutierrez Funderburg, who's going to talk about automating digital tech marketing. And she is a developer advocate for Plumer. She has over three years of professional experience in data science roles in a variety of settings, including for nonprofit, startups, as well as the private sector. She completed her bachelor's in mathematics from Simon Fraser University. Her alma mater also awarded her a Terry Fox gold medal in 2019 in recognition of her ability to face adversity and give back to the communities she is a part of. Laura is giving back to the community for Fourth Brain today. I'm so pleased to welcome Laura to the stage to talk about automating digital tech marketing. Laura, off to you. 
Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you so much for having me as part of the showcase. I'm really excited to share with you this project. Um, so let me jump in and get started. So um, the project in particular that I worked on was uh, automating tick digital marketing. And for this, I'm going to be focusing on some of the key elements that I took from Fourth Brain's course when I was solving this particular problem. I had a chance to combine a number of different technologies. I learned how to use things like the OpenAI API along with LangChain. And I also learned how to fine tune an LLM for my specific use case. So as Greg mentioned, um, uh, my background is in mathematics and Python programming. I have held roles both as a data scientist and currently as a developer advocate. I have a strong focus on automating processes. And I was very blown away by the current developments in both uh, the AI space and the large language model space. I was very eager to, to learn more. And I, I, I saw Fourth Brain's course and I, I was curious to take a peek. I had a chance to see some of the YouTube videos that they hosted. And I, I yeah, I was quite intrigued by the program. So I, I, I took a chance and I tried it. Um, I want to share where I was at before uh, before I, I learned with Fourth Brain. So I was comfortable exploring the open AI API documentation, but I wasn't exactly sure what to do with it or what to where to take it. Um, I had heard about tools like Langchain, but I also hadn't had a ch chance to apply them. And there, there was all of this um, burst of information on the internet uh, as, as things were exploding. It was kind of hard to, to know what to pick and what to focus on. So I think I felt a little bit overwhelmed. I had also heard about things like fine tuning LLMs, but I wasn't sure how that worked or, or how I could use it for. Um, so that is, you know, I kind of started off from this uh, curiosity based space where there's like a ton of information out there, but I wasn't quite sure where to start or what to pick or what to focus on. So I think the course with Fourth Brain really helped me uh, find an opportunity to just pick something and then uh, have access to, to material to learn while at the same time working towards uh, a capstone. So some of the things that I learned by the end of this three-week journey is uh, I learned how to connect to the OpenAI API and uh, Langchain to perform NLP-based tasks. Uh, furthermore, I learned how to set up agents with Langchain. I think I had heard a lot about agents, but I wasn't quite sure to get started. So I was really happy to get the ability to get up an agent up and running. I also learned how to structure prompts to get the results I'm seeking, how to tweak the prompts in case the results aren't quite uh, like what I'm looking for. And I also learned about a highly efficient fine tuning technique for applying LLMs to my use case. Uh, this was really useful in terms of knowing how to fine tune open source LLMs and then apply them for my specific problem. And then, of course, the implication is that I now have the ability to use both private and open source LLMs. Uh, another area that I think was very new to me at the time before I started, sorry, was a uh, hugging face. I had heard about hugging face and I had heard about uh, uh, about it as a platform for loading models, but I hadn't actually used it. So by the end of the course, I felt comfortable loading data in models that other people had uh, uploaded there. But most importantly, I also learned how to share my own fine tuned models that so that others can use them. OK, so. Um, and I hope my screen didn't just freeze. Oh, I think it just froze. So let me just do a quick escape and let's jump to the next slide. Uh, apologies for that. So what problem did I work on? So I talked about uh, using this as a chance to do some automation. The specific piece of automation that I focused on was on automating. Um, and for me, one of the things that I do typically is uh, when when I work in, in open source projects, like the, the current project I'm part of has uh, open source projects that we maintain. Typically, what we'll do with these open source projects is we will spend some time together developing code. There will be a team that's dedicated towards solving issues on GitHub and then uh, rolling out new features. And then on my front, typically I work on writing about these features and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, educational content about how, about how to use the content. But then the question becomes, okay, so once we have a technique or once we have a tool out there for the community to use, how can we make sure that we reach them? So one of the things that we're using is social media to reach the community, uh, platforms such as LinkedIn, Twitter, Mastodon, uh, or YouTube, for instance, are platforms that we can use to reach out to the community. 
And so a lot of these open source projects, particularly the ones that are that are written in Python, typically use um, uh, has have very strong documentation using Markdown files and, and Sphinx. Uh, this is a combination of code and text, and we can use we can use these tools to generate web pages that we can then host and make it easier for others to find us and learn about our product. So. In terms of what I what I did in this particular uh, course, so during the three weeks that I was with Fourth Brain, I learned about uh, how to use OpenAI's API, how to use Langchain, how to fine tune an open source LLM, and then how to deploy my results on not results, sorry, my my data and my models on Hugging Face. So for this this particular problem, I used two approaches. The first approach is I set up an agent with Langchain and I used OpenAI's API to script data from a web page, in this case, a documentation, summarize the content of the documentation, and then transform the documentation. In my case, I chose to generate social media posts. Uh, and then the other approach that I learned about was how to fine tune an open source LLM with some data. So in this case, this was more focusing on, okay, so if I didn't want to use a private service, is there anything that I could use to, to, to work on this open source space? So I had a chance to work with a, a highly efficient uh, technique for fine tuning open source uh, uh, large language models. So the first approach with Langchain, the idea was to first uh, use beautiful soups to scrape the data from the blog posts, and then Langchain and OpenAIs uh, take the information from that blog post and generate a summary, use the summary to write the social media post, and then um, and then that's it. Now, because my focus was to automate, uh, then I not just did I set up uh, uh, the the code in a Jupyter notebook, but I also focused on, on wrapping it into functions and classes so that I could reuse them with the goal of automating steps for a number of different posts. If I take a look at the, the high level overview of what's going on, so I will have a, a, a tech tool block. This will be in the form of a web page. I will have a Langchain agent. And then the way I structured it is I set it up a web scraper and I attached it to a Langchain tool by a decorator. And then from there, the next step, the other uh, the other function that I gave the agent via the tool decorator was the, the ability to generate a summary. So I connected Langchain to an OpenAI API prompt, whose job was to take us and put the content of the scraped web page, and then summarize uh, summarize the content of that web page, and then transform it a little bit more so that. Uh, I could then see, okay, so how will it do when I ask it to go from summary to social media post? So that was the idea. Um, now, if I if I may, so one of the things that I, I was really happy with at the course is that I learned how to structure my prompts um, in a way that I can easily tweak them. Some of the things that I learned as part of the, the course included the, the difference between system content and user content and how to use them to maximize the results that I'm seeking. So in this slide here that I'm showing, I'm, sh I'm showing uh, the prompter class. This prompter class was, uh, or the, the, the bare bone structure of it was provided uh, in the course. And then from there, I had a chance to expand it to include the social media wizard. Uh, these two pieces were sort of uh, introduced in the course and then I had the chance to expand as I needed. So I was quite happy that it was fairly easy for me to just take what I learned from the course and apply it directly to my use case. In this case, the prompt in question that I that I focused on was on on really seeking or or asking for a specific voice or a specific um, content. In this case, the social media wizard, which is a function under the prompter class, has the role of a digital marketing person with knowledge about technology. In this case, I asked it to have a bit more of a professional tone. In the past, I played a lot with emojis, but then I found that it was kind of excessive. So I kind of I, I kind of had a chance to tweak a little bit with the content a bit and see if I could get different voices. And so I found this approach extremely useful for playing with those kinds of things and then assessing the results. And then the main program, uh, so where I actually get to use Langchain, so Langchain will be connected to a model. In this case, again, I focused on using private uh, private models. I use GPT-4. And then the agent will be, will be given access to functions. So in this case, the extract data from page was a function whose job was to like uh, scrape a web page. If you have worked with beautiful soups, that's all it did. It just, we just gave it a link. And then as, as output, it returned the content of that page. 
And then this generate post uh, is just a function who, that just calls the prompter I just showed you. So the agent had access to these two tools. I used a chat zero shot react description. And then the agent was given two instructions. The first instruction was to summarize the content of the post. In this case, it, it took us input a URL. It, it extracted the data from the page and then it, it outputted a, uh, the whole content. So the agent had to summarize that. And then the second instruction the agent had was to generate a social media post for the summary that I just generated. So this is the approach uh, of using OpenAI API along with Langchain. Now, I did mention that um, I had a chance to work with two approaches. So a couple problems with this, a couple problems with the approach, of course, is cost. You know, when using private services, uh, there's you have to submit your credit card, you have to pay every time you make a call to the API. Uh, another area that I noticed was tricky was uh, the generation of, of posts. Uh, sometimes uh, summarizing and transforming the content took a few, uh, quite a bit of time. Sometimes I think because the opening API is quite overloaded, I would get a, a 502 uh, saying that it was busy, and then the agent would typically retry until it succeeded. And then, of course, the other one is like, OK, so now the posts like I have this code and, you know, I could probably put it on GitHub or something. But then what if I wanted someone else to use this without having to 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 go through the private approach? So the next approach I tried was with uh, fine tuning an open source LLM. So this used a bit of a combination of the previous approach. Now you're welcome to try this approach uh, purely open source via curating a good data set. In this case, I use a combination of existing posts and their, their existing summary, along with some synthetic data that I obtained via using the first approach. Now, in this case, um, what I did in terms of curating a data set is you can think of the curated data set as a JSON, JSON um, structure, where I will have two main keys, a summary of, of a topic, and then uh, the modified um, summary to reflect a social media post with a specific tone or a specific voice. So in this case, this is what I mean by curated. I had like a bunch of entries uh, in this JSON structure, um, for the project, I then uploaded this data to Hugging Face, and then I was able to load that from Hugging Face to fine tune the LLM. Uh, this means that this data set can be accessed by others who have access to or who know the path to the Hugging Face data set. And then once this is done, uh, the approach that I learned as part of Fourth Brain was uh, parameter efficient, sorry, parameter efficient tuning, uh, PEFT, low ranking adaptation, or LoRa and uh, the use of transformers. In this case, the open source model that we used was Bloom Z. And then the techniques that we learned in the class were parameter efficient tuning, low rank adaptation, and then the use of transformers to fine tune the model with the data. So all of these concepts, we didn't get a chance to go too, too much in depth into, into um, the works because of how the, the time constraint, but the key thing that I wanna give away from this is that we had a chance to, follow uh, an existing problem that fine-tuned a model using these techniques. And then for me, it was quite easy to just take this code and then apply it to my use case because we had the we had practice with the notebooks. We had had a chance to see a problem from, from uh, start to bottom, all the way from learning how to load these uh, models from Hugging Face all the way to fine-tuning. So it was quite easy for me to just take that existing code and then apply it. And the reason it was easy is because we had not just the notebooks that we could use, but also we had the opportunity to discuss them in class and between ourselves. So it, there were a lot of opportunities to really digest the content and then transform it into something that was useful. And then the last thing is deploy the fine-tuned model to Hugging Face. So with the deployed model, I can then generate uh, posts. So the, the final workflow, if I am to share sort of the, the two approaches and what I did to automate the digital marketing workflows, well, okay, I had a collection of blog posts. I used my Langchain agent to scrape, summarize, and transform the summary. And then from here, I generated uh, a data set. So the data set, as I mentioned, has uh, the structure or is structured into JSON format where I, I might have an ID, the summary, and then at the post. I go ahead and deploy this data set to Hugging Face. And then from Hugging Face, what's really neat about this particular project is that not only can I access my published data set, but I can also access a variety of open source large language models. In this case, we worked with, uh, sorry, with Bloomsy. Uh, so from here, 
from Hugging Face, we take the social media post data that I curated. We take the open source model. And then in this case, I just apply the techniques that I learned in class, uh, parameter efficient tuning, low ranking adaptation uh, to get transformers and then apply those transformers on my data. That's the model piece. The data piece, uh, I, I had my JSON structured data. I did a little bit of data processing and some prompting to prepare the training data. And then from here, uh, the end result are adapters. These adapters I can now go ahead and deploy, which means if someone wants to use my adapters to gener generate um, uh, a social media post from a summary, they can directly just go to Hugging Face, uh, use the, the card, the model card name, and then just use my fine tune model to make an inference and generate some of these posts. Okay, so in terms of what what does it mean for someone to make an inference? So this is this is uh, the whole the whole program to use the fine tune model that I that I worked on. So in this case, I have uh, an inference function that says, "Hey, you're going to have a summary of a blog post. Your job is to write a social media post." And in this case, my model was tuned for this specific task. Um, so from here, I will have the username, the name of the model. And then from here, I have um, I, I have to apply the primary efficient tuning configuration, just get um, the tokenizers, load my model. And then from here, I have the input, which is the topic. In this case, I will have an example of a, a summary. And then I can just call the function make inference pass as input the topic. And then as, a, as output, it will return uh, the post. OK, so just to wrap it up and to share with you some of the key things that I learned. So I learned how to connect OpenAI API to Langchain to perform NLP based tasks. So in particular, I learned how to connect or combine both uh, a scraper along with an open, OpenAI API um, call. You saw that I, I showed you previously a, a prompter class along with a digital marketing wizard method associated to that class. And then I showed you that with Langchain, I was able to combine not just the function that scrapes the data via the, the tool decorator, but I also showed you that you can combine it with prompts themselves to, to further process the information. And the workflow that I follow was, you know, take the raw information from the web page, transform it first by summarizing, and then transform it again by changing the tone. Um, the key thing here is the use of agents. In this case, the agent was tasked with uh, an instruction. The, the, the structure was agent.run followed by a natural language uh, instruction. And then the idea was to give access uh, tools to the agent. In this case, the agent had access to the web scraper uh, function as well as the prompter class that I had sh shared. Uh, how to structure the prompts to get the results that I'm seeking. So I learned I learned how to initialize uh, the prompter. I learned how to define functionality under the prompter. And then uh, for me, I think the key thing that I want to give away is uh, learning how to structure the system versus content, uh, user content uh, prompts to make sure that you're getting the results that you're seeking. Um, how to tweak the prompts. So once I think really the key thing is asking the, the system to, to go for specific tones or go for specific instructions. In this case, the kinds of things that I did is I asked it to be, you know, be assume that you're an expert in digital marketing, assume that you have knowledge about specific technologies, and then uh, ask it, uh, you know, please write this in a professional tone or please write this in a, in a fun tone. Those kinds of things, this is what I mean by tweaking. The other thing that I think was quite important was the ability to fine tune large language models and in particular open source large language models. Um, I think what's really cool about this course is that we we didn't we, we didn't just learn oh this is how you can fine tune a large language model is the fact that we learned a highly efficient uh, method to do this, which means down the road if you wanna if you wanna if you wanna apply large language models or open source large language models for a different use case, not just you, you, you're not left with the you know endless possibility of all these different methods, but you have a very specific set of steps that you can follow and replicate. And then of course the ability to use both private and open source. There's there's uh, strengths and weaknesses to both. You know one one of the challenges with open source LLMs is okay, so you have a, a fine tune LLM. Now where do you host it? Uh, what what do you do with it? So. I think having the ability to know from both would allow you or would empower you to know when to use which and for what use cases. 
And then I think this one was one that I that I'm I'm really really happy with because I I came into the course not knowing anything about hugging face and I left uh, I left not just comfortable loading other people's uh, models into my local computer but I also learned how to share my own fine tuned models with others. Um, and that's it. So I'll open it up for questions now. And then, yeah, I'm really grateful for the chance that I had to learn with fourth grade. I think really the key thing is I came into the course feeling like, you know, I, I knew very little about things. There was this like explosion of knowledge on the internet about open AI's AI, about large language models. And I think what was really crucial for me was having the ability to pick specific um, topics and then transform them to my use case. It made me feel quite confident in knowing that I can apply them to solve more problems down the line. Laura, great stuff. Thank, thank you, you so really much for sharing. Uh, you know, it looks like we got a couple of questions from the audience related to your project. You know, you talked a little bit about open source versus closed source. So Fred Melander asks, can you compare the cost of approach one to the cost of your second approach, where the first one is sort of the CPU, GPU approach? The second one is the hugging face versus open AI's uh, GPT 3.5, GPT 4. Uh, I think I think what we're getting at is can you compare sort of the the local to the hitting APIs approach um, a, a little bit for the audience? What you learned there? Yes. Yeah. So I think on average you know, prototyping and using this on about 100 to 150 blog posts using the private approach, I think I spent like $25. And, you know, every now and then when I use it again, it's like a few cents already because I don't use it very heavily. Um, now, in terms of the open a, the the open open source approach, you know, uh, the, the really the two costs are GPU usage. So in this case, I did this on a local machine, but I don't have a, I don't have my GP, my GPUs aren't super buff. So what I, what we ended up doing is we used a Google Cola Pro. I think that's 13 or 14 USD dollars a month, or you can buy credits. Um, the other aspect of using a fine-tuned LLM is the hosting. So I think that's one of the things that are typically not talked about. So one of the advantages of using OpenAI's API is they are already hosting it and you're 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 paying to make inferences that's one way to think about it you're just paying to use the service that they host now if you don't want to pay the service that they host then you have to ask yourself a question okay so where am i hosting it and what are what is the cost so there's two costs when it comes to fine tuning open source llms first you know you 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 pull it from hugging face and then you have to decide okay so where is it going to live is it going to live on on aws is it going to have its own vm that's one thing. Uh, then there's going to be the cost of GPU while you fine tune, you know, you're hosting it and you're fine tuning it. So there's going to be additional GPU cost. And then there's going to be the cost of making inferences. What's the cost going to be for someone else making making the calls on your on your open source LLM? So I because in this this particular project, I didn't go through the stages of actually deploying. I can't answer how much it costs me, but but these are some of the costs to keep in mind if you're thinking of, of using open source. Uh, LLMs. Very cool. Very cool. We've got a couple questions that have come in. So we're going to try to get through these relatively quickly. Um, uh, Joa Pedro Pereira asks, what's the size of the model if I want to use it on my notebook? What's the size of the model that you used? Um, see, I don't remember the size of this model. Yeah. I think I might need to ask for help here, Greg. <laughs> I, I believe it was the uh, 1B7 model. So I, I think we... Uh, we it was or the three B seven it was either I think it's three B yeah, yeah yeah so I believe that's three billion parameters but the the Laura approach was allowing you to do it a lot quicker right everything a lot quicker the uh, the low rank adaptation and the parameter efficient fine tuning so you know I think the size of the model is a you know it's important to look at the sizes and try to figure out exactly what you're doing and and how you're doing it and and that was one of the things that we we tried to do in the course is to really reduce the size of the models so that we could reduce the costs associated with fine tuning those um uh, mark asks a great question uh can we see an example of the final social media posts yes. uh, i believe uh you know we can definitely post that and reshare it at fourth brain on linkedin uh following the event during the event 
Um, but the people want to see it. So Laura definitely will have to uh, make sure we get an example out there. And then okay. I can uh, I can do that, actually. Um, yeah. And then uh, the last question before we move on to, to catch his presentation today is Ayanar asks, are there any performance evaluation sort of conclusions based on your approach one versus approach two? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Are there any sort of performance evaluation conclusions? Like, did you, oh, like did you sort of have any kind of either the benchmarking or anecdotal, you know, did you notice any real difference? Anecdotal, I think, um, so I think making an inference once I had a fine-tuned model was faster than getting the agent to scrape and summarize and do do um, or, or transform the content. Um, having said that, I think, you know, the fi fine tuning is tricky because like if, if I think about how long it took, like I spent a lot more time on curating the data set and fine tuning it than actually using it. So I think, it, yeah, I think if I were to pick a long term approach, you know, I would probably invest time in curating a good data set and fine tuning and make sure that, that I'm happy with. And then that sort of takes the brunt of the work and I'm, I, I can have something efficient. But I, I did have to invest that time curating a good quality data set versus if you don't have access to a good quality data set, then the trade off of, OK, I'll just go ahead and use the open AI API and the, and the agent might be a better solution. Hmm. Very, I think the very trick, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for your presentation. We'll welcome you back to the stage when we were going into um, the second round of QA. Um, and uh, Alejandra, we will answer your question uh, later on when we have both speakers on stage uh, toward the end of the of today's event. So, again, thank you, Laura. Um, thanks everybody uh, for tuning in to Laura's presentation. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next speaker of the day. And we are going to meet Kachator Mirajanyan. And Kach, also goes by Kach here, is an experienced data scientist based in San Jose who is passionate about machine learning technology. So much so, he often spends a lot of his free time neck deep in statistical and machine learning books and research papers. Previously, he worked in both ML engineer and ML researcher roles and has experience constructing deep learning models for audio systems. He received his BS in computer science from UC Santa Cruz and his MS in statistics from UC Berkeley. Catch is here to talk to us today about his project on NBA stats. Catch, welcome. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so Laura did a fantastic job characterizing the stuff we learned throughout our um, workshop. Why don't I go ahead and share my screen real quick? There you go. So before I uh, hop into this, um, I do want to say where I was at when I walked into this workshop. I had effectively not sort of hopped into the world of of text AI, deep learning text AI in, in years. Um, Greg mentioned that I did my uh, I did my bachelor's at UC Santa Cruz. That was really the last time. Uh, I was uh, I was a research assistant, an undergraduate research assistant at the Natural Language and Dialogue Lab at the time. Um, and to give you a bit of a, some context of where text AI large language models were at back then, uh, attention is all you need. The paper that a lot of this stuff is really based on had kind of just came out. People were just figuring out how to use it in all these different applications. Um, and then basically since then, I had done more or less nothing uh, in this in this space. So when it comes to uh, a blank slate, like as a programmer, I was about as a blank slate as you can get um, in the world of large language models. So I was really excited to hop in and, and try new things and, and check all this new stuff out and see what I could do with it. Uh, and this is what I did with it. I did NBA stats, uh, natural language SQL. So, uh, whoops, there we go, there we go. The goal and the purpose, what is this? Um, in week two of the workshop, as Greg mentioned, we did a lot of 
well, what if you have your own set of documents? How do we search it? How do we do large language models on your own set of documents? So I thought to myself, well, if you can do it on documents, can't you do it on other stuff? Can't you do it on a database, right? Um, so that was kind of the goal. I want to be able to search a SQL database using natural language. Um, this gives you, you know, a variety of ways to look at data retrieval. It can be used by a lot of different kinds of people. This could be super useful for businesses. This could be super useful for just enthusiasts for having fun. Um, and honestly, if you don't know how to write SQL, if you don't really know how to code, it's just a great way to do some data retrieval uh, if it works. So how did I come across you know, this kind of a project? Um, in week two, like I said, um, with the data retrieval section of the workshop, uh, this SQL idea came into mind, but I'm like, well, what kind of data am I gonna use? How is this all gonna work out? Uh, so I started with what I'm interested in. As it turns out all around this time, the, uh, the NBA finals were going on. I'm a big basketball fan. So, and, and I like looking at like stats and stuff, uh, especially uh, sports stats. So it was, it was kind of perfect uh, given the timing. Um, data availability, very important. Uh, could I get this data? As it turns out, yeah, NBA data is relatively available. Um, and then looking at the kind of project and the kind of learnings we had done up to this point, I knew it had to be relatively small scale, basically a, a proof of concept for what was possible. Um, and throughout this process, uh, we'd learned about LangChain. And LangChain was super cool to me. There was a lot of different things you could do with it. LangChain is pretty new, um, but in the LLM space, everything is always new. It's it's always new stuff, always new stuff coming up all the time. So uh, being able to use these new tools is really important, especially because they can be pretty robust and, uh, and, and pretty impressive. And I was pretty impressed with LangChain. Um, and finally, what the sort of grounding principle for this was I wanted to feel unique. I want it to be something where I can't just hop into chat GPT or whatever and just do it, right? Um, and that's part of the reason I wanted to do the NBA stats because right now, if you try to go to chat GPT and ask it about, you know, what happened during the latest NBA regular season, it can't tell you because that data doesn't exist for it. Uh, and that's really where a lot of um, LLM applications, I think is what you're going to see going to the future is taking your bespoke data, your most recent data, or your private data, and applying LLMs for specific tasks. Um, the general purpose stuff will always be there, but for a lot of businesses, I think you're going to see this sort of focusing in on what they have, and what they have is going to be a determinant of what they end doing. Um, and that's what led me to this. So the data. Like I said, very easily accessible NBA basketball data. You can get this stuff anywhere. Um, it's also really small scale. I wanted to start small scale um, and I wanted to do a couple of things with it. So I only really have one regular season of stats. You're talking about player stats, team stats, some team information like roster information. Um, and I had two different databases. So I was trying to solve two different problems. One of the databases is nice and concise. Like for example, if you look at game logs, right? You'll have just a table of game logs of all the players in all the teams. And then, you know, in a different database, it was much more haphazard. Like you had a, you had a table for every player, which is hundreds of tables, much less concise, much less consolidated, which kind of mirrors what you might see um, in a lot of real world uh, databases for a lot of businesses. Um, and I wanted to know, can the system understand the tables and can the system understand all this basketball jargon? Picking the right tool here was important. Uh, LangChain was the tool I ended up using. Uh, it's a new framework developed for, uh, for developing new LLM applications. It can do a lot of different things, but its major functionality is its agents and its chains. The agents are effectively the interface with what your data is. And the chain is sort of the chain of steps that it's going to take to answer a question or what have you. Um, prompting is very important. Um, you're going to see when I do a very brief overview of the code um, that 
the prompting can help guide your system. And I ended up using OpenAI's embeddings because one, they're very well integrated into LangChain, and two, it just makes things easier in the sort of proof of concept stage. Later on, if you were to sort of expand this out, make something bigger, you'd probably want to consider dabbling into an open source system, get your own hosting. But in this small scale, uh, in the small scale project, it's, it was easier to use OpenAI's embeddings. Um, now, before I hop into the questions, I will show you a brief look at the code. So this is straight from where it's hosted up on Hugging Face. Um, as you can see, it's Langchain all the way down, and I use Chat GPT. Uh, I use GPT 3.5 Turbo, um, and it's relatively short. There's the learning was most of what happened. Uh, this was put together after a very, very like. I wouldn't say rigorous, but like information intensive uh, workshop of learning, maybe two, a good two weeks in, I started working on this and it took a few days, not very long. It took a few days, but more or less it works. Um, and there's this Gradio app integrated that you're going to see, which again, they showed us how to do. It's all very, this is all very simple, bare bones stuff. Um, but, you know, it all starts from asking for your query. Once you get your query, you go, you get your, your database. In this case, I have two different databases, the NBA small DB and the NBA DB. Um, and there's a query check and you'll see what how this all works together in a second. So this is where your database connection is. This is how uh, your model is gonna understand your database. And then you see here, your chain, this is your database chain. Here I pass my LLM, which is uh, gonna be GPT 3.5 turbo. And then I have this prompt. Now what's the prompt? Well, this is the guide I talked about. It's this default template. Um, this was basically pulled directly from um, Langchain's docs. Their docs, they're not the greatest in the world, but they're still super useful. Uh, and this does help sort of tell the system, hey, here are the steps that you're gonna be taking. And you can actually view this based on some parameters. Um, going back to our slides here. So for that consolidated database, there's a couple of questions I want to ask. And you see the questions here. On average, who scores the most points and who scores the most points per game? Those are the same question, but you're going to see different answers because prompting matters. And when you, when you don't fine tune things, which I hadn't done, I basically used everything out of the box. Um, you're going to run into some issues and you're going to see some of those issues. Who averages the most triple doubles? Um, again, we're going to see, is it going to understand that jargon and is it going to return correctly? And then a bit of a more complicated question, give me the top five players with the most games with 25 plus points, five plus assists, five plus rebounds. Each player had and returned the answer as a numbered list one through five in this format. So you have things like points, assists, and rebounds in abbreviations to see if it understands that. You're asking it for a specific format. You're asking it for a numbered list, just throwing a ton of stuff at the question, at the system. Uh, so let's look at it. Who, at, who, on average, who scores the most points? Final answer, on average, Joel Embiid scores the most points with an average of 33.1 points per game. That is correct. Uh, you see this final answer here thing? When I built this project, this final answer, it wasn't here. It would just say on average, Joel Embiid, yada, yada, yada. This is kind of the nature of, uh, of developing in this new space. Whether something changed in the link chain or something changed in the way OpenAI is sending its embeddings, now the answers are sometimes going to be delivered like this instead of the way they used to be. So it's one of those things where because things are changing all the time, you're going to find that things that you're working on can suddenly change as well in slight ways like this. If we then go on to the other question, who scores the most points per game? Damian Lillard scores the most points per game with an average of 0.555. What happened here was that it got confused by the tables, the tables, the column names in the tables. Um, it, because of the way the question was phrased, it was looking in the wrong places. And this is where you can say, man, I really wish I had fine tuned my model. Or also as importantly, I really wish I had made my table names and the columns of my tables in a specific way so that it could interact better with queries. 
All of this is important. The prompt is, impo is important and the data you're giving it is very important. Next, we wanna ask who averages the most triple doubles? Final answer, Zion Williamson averages the most triple doubles. This is absolutely not true. Um, this also went to the wrong tables. It looked at the wrong things. It did understand what a triple double was though. Uh, if I showed you the logs, you would see it 100% knew what a triple double was, but it didn't understand where to go get that information. But on the other hand, that long question I mentioned where give me these top five players, it gave it to me exactly the way I wanted it. It's a numbered list. It gives me the right players in the right order. And it gives me the number right next to it. So again, this is the nature of LLM development. Sometimes you're going to get weird things. Um, but as a proof of concept, you can see that like with relatively limited training and relatively limited understanding, which is where I was at at the time of this, it all still kind of works. Uh, looking at the second part of this question, which was this disorganized database, I ran into some issues uh, and it forced me to try a couple of things, which was not only just the query, but um, the format of the query and what is gonna be asked of this system. And in this case, you have to ask it exactly what tables to look from. If you don't, and you have this super large database, you're gonna run into problems. Again, something that can probably be fine tuned, but it's gonna be a series of challenges you're gonna run into when using a lot of these bespoke tools like Langchain, when you're not doing everything from the absolute ground up. Um, so let's look at these questions. Compare Malcolm Brogdon and DeMar DeRozan. And then who has more 15 point games, DeMar or Malcolm? As you can see in the first question, relatively vague, right? What does comparison mean? And the second question, I'm not even using their last names. I'm just saying, hey, DeMar, Malcolm, let's see if you can figure it out given the tables that I'm gonna send to you. And the first one, it's literally just telling you exactly who they are. Malcolm Brogdon, here's what he averages. Here's his stats on average. DeMar DeRozan, here's what he averages. Here's his stats on average, given to you on a silver platter. So tell, but comparison can mean a lot of things, right? It's not saying who's better. It's not saying who's worse. It's not saying the differences or whatever. It's just giving you their stats and saying, hey, you want to compare them? Well, here you go. Here's what I believe is important for comparison. And the second one, very, very specific. Who has more 15-point games, DeMar or Malcolm? Oh, well, DeMar has more 15-point games. You didn't, because you didn't ask it how many more games, you didn't ask it anything else. It's just very, very simple. DeMar has 15 plus point games with 64 games. Um, all of this can break relatively easily. Uh, like I said, these systems can be pretty fragile sometimes. Um, it does take a lot of work to iron out all the issues at the ones I showed you before. But at least for me, coming into this, knowing as little as I did, to be able to put this together and effectively from like data collection all the way to, you know, app deployment, where I I worked through that up until basically the last second. Um, this took about three days. That three days before three days before the presentation day in the workshop is when I started this. That's when I felt comfortable enough with what I had learned to tackle this kind of problem. And my, you know, Estimations were right since I was able to put something together. Um, there were a lot of design challenges. Like I said, everything has to be named right. The right prompts make a big difference. Prompt templates in your code, the ones I showed you can add a lot of power to your prompts and providing more context to the system is really important. Prompting matters. Prompting matters a lot. Prompting matters from the querying end, Prompting matters from the back from the back end in the coding. There's a lot of prompt engineering you can do from a engine like a coding engineering back end perspective, and there's a lot of work to do there. And in terms of the technical challenges, like you saw, sometimes the SQL queries just don't work, and token limits are the biggest issue. If you have too many tables, if you have queries that are too long, if your tables have too much information, you are going to hit certain query limits. Uh, Pre-training would probably solve this issue, but that's its own bag of worms that you would have to open up and, and work through. So you, you create a question of 
Do I want to expose all of my tables to every question? Do I only want to expose the tables that are necessary? How do I do all these things? This is what I mean by you take, when I mentioned at the beginning, take a small project, a proof of concept with room to grow. Uh, and here is where the room to grow really is. That's basically the extent of this project. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I think the I think the link to the project will be shared in the chat. So you guys feel free to go on there, ask it a bunch of questions. Uh, it's connected to OpenAI, so you guys are spending my pennies, but I don't mind. It's okay. Um, and have fun with it. Um, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll be right, sometimes it'll be wrong. But I had a lot of fun working on it, and I had a great time with the workshop, working with the people there, uh, including a lot of the students. There was a lot of collaboration, uh, and it was, it was really fun. It was really educational. Catch. Awesome, man. Very, very cool. Uh, really great to see that MBA stats project come together and, uh, and you know, just really, really good stuff all around. It looks like we are at about 152. I think we're going to go ahead and welcome Laura back up to the stage. And we've got a couple questions that we want to ask, uh, get both of your perspectives on. So, uh, you know, everybody in the chat, let's give a round of applause to Laura and Catch. Thank you so much for sharing. Great job, both of you. You know, we got a we got a question from Alejandra earlier. How much LLM fine tuning do you need to know before a course like this? Or do you think it is enough to just enter the course without really knowing? Catch, what's your perspective on this? I'm going to go ahead and say this. I knew absolutely zero about LLM fine tuning. Uh, I won't lie, I you know I do have some deep learning experience in general, but when it comes to like I said the LLM space, going into it, especially going to these workshops, I was going in like a baby. I knew absolutely nothing. Uh, the only things that I knew that helped me were my general understanding of programming. That's key insight, Laura. You have anything? Uh... To say about I would, yeah, LLM I think I fine tuning, I, I didn't know anything about how to tune a, a fine tune on LLM when I came into the course. I think I I agree that having comfort comfort with programming and some familiarity with ML for classical supervised learning, if you have those two, I think it'll make uh, adapting much much smoother. Having said that, if you don't, if you come here and you just say no, I'm just comfortable with programming, I think that's enough. I think. Part of what was really helpful was having access to the discussion groups where we get to share with, with our classmates and sort of work through the problems together and then get back into the rooms and talk with Greg and Chris. Um, but yeah, I think if you have comfort with programming, that's good. If you have comfort programming and so, some understanding of supervised machine learning techniques, even better. But yeah, I, you don't have to know anything about fine-tuning LLMs to, to benefit from the course. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just triple down on that. Yeah. Fundamental programming skills are really the prerequisite here. Uh, it is nice to have that background in supervised and unsupervised learning. However, you can pick these tools up. They're a lot more like building Lego blocks today than ever before. And it's, it's a lot more of an engineering task. So programming is very, very important. So, um, uh, well, Fred asks, catch this one's for you. Are you optimistic that your goals could eventually be achieved with LLMs. I'm not sure if that's goals for your project or goals in general, but you can take it either way you want. I'll take it with goals for the project. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say that, yeah, I think it would take a lot of work. At, there's a lot of steps to this problem from, I need to understand the question being asked. I need to understand what the database is. I need to understand the question being asked relative to the database. I need to be able to make my SQL query based on an understanding. Then I have to be able to deliver an answer based on the result of that query. So there's all these different steps and you don't have to do all of them yourself. Like this was me basically outsourcing every single step to LangChain, right? And, and there's going to be problems with that, you know, and you don't have to, do it that way for sure, but you don't have to do all of those steps all at once. It's very possible that you say, well, you know that step where you understand the database, maybe that's the real step that you need to really fine tune and take your time on. And then everything else will kind of fall into place. 
right? Again, I think it's incredibly doable, but of course you got to put in the work. It would take a lot of effort. So, you know. Right, right. hundred percent. And yeah, I mean, as we get more complex with the applications that we're trying to build with LLMs and Langchain and putting things together, I mean, things get pretty crazy pretty quickly. And that's, that's I think, where the engineering piece and the, the fundamental coding piece comes in. Um, okay, so I feel like we, we, we got a few questions about sort of in general, uh, kind of just learning this stuff. And, and I guess really, you know, there are a few questions in the chat that I'll encourage, you know, Catch and Laura to, to look at and potentially respond to with, with a comment on the YouTube page later. Um, but, you know, in the interest of time, like, I think one of the things I'd like to ask everybody, and one of the things I'd like to ask both of you today before we before we kind of close up is, you know, what has been the most challenging part of sort of staying up to date with AI? Pre the course, post the course, right now, daily in your life? I mean, um, how are you doing this right now? Have you made it to the other side yet? Um, and how's it going? Laura, let's start with you. Yes, um, I think that prior to the course, the feeling I had was there was always something new that I didn't know about, and it felt very overwhelming. Um, I think what was tricky about it was knowing what to pick, knowing what to focus on, and sort of learning what to invest in. And post the course, I feel, I think what changed is it's more easy for me to relate the new things to what I already learned and sort of build on top. So I think I don't, I don't have that sense of feeling overwhelmed anymore. It's like, okay, so I, I picked things that I think are worth investing in and I, I was able to turn it into something that is useful for, for me, for my team, and I can continue, continue doing this. Um, so I think in terms of how, how it is going now, I think I just try to continue upgrading. I, imagine you have a house and you have your, 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 your foundation, so you can just add in complexity. But I think what was really important for me was knowing what to pick as, as my base and then go from there. Hmm. And, and catch, I mean, you were an ML researcher, an ML engineer, data scientist, data scientist, and yet you came into this and you're like, yeah, I really wasn't sure what exactly was going on with this AI stuff. Like what, what's your, how's it going with you now? And uh, what would your advice be to everybody else out there? My advice would be just do stuff. Um, like it, at my job, right? I don't get to do all this LLM stuff. And you know what? That might change soon because I've I've went to this workshop and I learned a bunch of stuff. And who knows? Maybe, you know, tomorrow I can I can approach the decision makers and say, hey, you know, you guys got all this text data here and you guys do all this stuff. I know LLMs. Maybe we can do something. Um, but in terms of everything else, like you can watch the YouTube videos, right? Super helpful. You can read the research papers, which is super, super, super helpful if you can understand them because they can give you a lot of insight on what's going on. But ultimately, taking all of this and just trying to build stuff, that's where the keeping up with it comes from. That's where the learning comes from. When you're not doing it, you're not really learning it. And being part of the community helps a lot too. Um, you know, everybody's always building new stuff. Everybody's always trying new things. And when you got friends, basically, uh, who are doing it, it's much easier to ma maintain this level of involvement. Uh, so that's one thing that was great with fourth brain. I got to meet a lot of, a lot of really cool, really smart people. So constantly being connected with them, seeing what they're working on helps me stay involved in the community and helps me stay up to date with what's going on. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Great insights from both of you. And before we wrap up, I just want to address one other question from, Awesome. Who uh, who asks about sort of what's the best place to start if you're planning to use LLMs for your organization where you got private data and you don't really know exactly um, how to go about it. I mean, this is one of the things that everybody's asking about. So we've got you know OpenAI. Nobody wants to put their data into OpenAI's API. Totally get it. Um, OpenAI for us at Fourth Brain is a great learning tool. It's a great entry point. We wouldn't necessarily encourage you to put your company's data in there. There are a lot of open source models that we go into as well that you 
would then need to host sort of on premises in a way or in your own cloud provider. So the commercially viable options that have come out even since we did this first cohort have been crazy. I mean, we saw Falcon come out. We've seen a lot of other commercially available really nice Apache 2.0 license models come out that we can use. However, you know, from a learning perspective, it's really just easier to kind of build with the industry standard tools. As you get into the specific for your company, that's something that, you know, we'd love to talk to you more about uh, at Fourth Brain within the course and, and beyond if you have further questions. Um, but we do try to focus on both because we know that both are really useful. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to address that last one. Again, I encourage Laura and catch both of you to check out some of the questions in the chat. I think at least one or two for each of your specific projects. Thank you all for your great questions. Let's give one final big shout out to Laura and Catch. You crushed it today, both of you. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's event. We hope you've enjoyed your time with us and have a few lessons learned to take with you as you continue your journey into generative AI and LLMs. If you're interested in building an LLM project like one of the ones you saw today, please consider joining our second cohort of Building with LLM starting next Tuesday, July 11th at 3 p.m. Pacific. We are also excited to announce a brand new one-day workshop called, called Building Chat GPT for Your Data, which is focused explicitly on Langchain development, which we'll be offering Thursday, July 20th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific. So that's it for today. We look forward to continue bringing you more Project Showcase events in the future. Until then, everybody, keep learning. Bye, everyone. Let's say, let's say bye to the audience, guys. Thanks, Catch. Thanks, Thank Laura. You. See you all soon. Again.